I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Welcome to Studio Sacramento. I'm your host, Scott Syfax. Today's show is in partnership with the local chapter of the American Leadership Forum, an organization where leaders come together to unite, strengthen, and serve, all for the benefit of our community. ALF has helped us to select today's guests and topic, the state of arts organizations within our region and the happenings that are going on today. Joining me today is Bill Blake, Managing Director of the B Street Theater, Lyle Jones, the Mort and Marcy Freeman Director of the Crocker Art Museum, and Dennis Mangers, a longtime advocate for the arts. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Let's start with this. The Sacramento region is undergoing its greatest economic challenge, probably since the Great Depression. Yet in the midst of all of the economic stress that we're under, three new artistic venues have either opened or are in the, pre, uh, in the uh, beginning of opening uh, in the near future. And that is the B Street, which you're getting very, very close to being able to move forward with construction. <coughs> the Crocker's new expansion, exciting all on its own. And three stages out at Folsom Lake College. All of this is happening swimming against the tide of economic uncertainty and a lot of job loss, not only within this region, across the country. We've been hard pressed to find any other region having that sort of facilities production at the current time. Help us understand why this good news is happening in Sacramento and what's its significance. Well, I think that one thing is these institutions are not built overnight. So mm -hmm. there is a lead up process. And if you look at, you know, prior to the stock market collapse and the economic collapse, most of these projects were somewhere in um, thought or feasibility study. So that does help. I mean, there is a lead time. Um, you know, art museums generally take over 10 years to come to fruition from their planning stages. That's what the Crocker took actually not a bad place but when you look at where we opened on 10 10 10 right. you have to look back to 2000 okay all right yeah, definitely and, and the these projects go on for a long time <coughs> performing arts centers as well can take 10 to 20 years to to bring around and and uh, three and I think the the folks at three stages would tell you yeah this was in their mind's eye from for a long time and those those things were all happening in the early 2000s and the public money was put up then and then actually because of the recession, their construction costs actually came in at about 2002 uh, estimates because the, the price, of, price of building. Fortuitous yeah. timing, so uh -huh. to speak. Mm -hmm. Dennis, give us, as a, as a longtime observer and patron of the arts, <coughs> give us an idea of the significance of this sort of fortuitous uh, circumstance taking place in Sacramento today. Well, I think it's uh, particularly important given the state from an operational standpoint of most of our performing arts organizations in the uh, region which are, are severely strained right now. There is another piece of good news that we fail to mention, and that is Capital Stage mm -hmm. is currently uh, preparing to move off of the Delta King, a very small theater, into a better space in Midtown where it should be. And it has a niche uh, audience and a good board that's been very strong in development. So it's another success story. But in the middle of those success stories, there are a number of capital campaigns that were stalled by the recession, uh, certain other museums and <clears throat> performing arts groups. And the real challenge right now is in the midst of this good news is to find a way to make our traditional arts organizations sustainable over the long haul. Well, let, let's talk about that for a second. <clears throat> How does Sacramento stack up nationally with regards to its support for the, uh, for the arts, both in audience and also in terms of donors? The uh, Sacramento Regional Community Regional Foundation just recently conducted a study, I think, related to the Generosity Project and found that of regions our size, 
Ours is the lowest in terms of per capita philanthropic giving. In fact, worse news yet, the demographic at the top of the wage earners over $200,000 in this region give less than their counterparts in the other regions. It, it's been estimated that if we came up to just the average for uh, regions this size, we would add $215 million annually. $215? $215 million annually would be available to our nonprofit organizations if our level of personal giving were commensurate with that in other regions. Lyle, size. what do you think that that would mean <coughs> to this region from an arts perspective? From an arts perspective, it's huge. You know, um, this, this area has had a lack of a history of philanthropy for a very long time. This is our opportunity in the next five, 10, 20 years to really change that. Uh, there's a tremendous generational shift in wealth, and if we don't do something to capture that, our institutions are not going to continue 20, 30, 50 years from now. They are simply not sustainable with the level, historic level of giving in Sacramento. So it's, it's a huge, it's, it's absolutely important that everybody understand the fact that we're not performing to the rest of the country uh, and also does something about it and does something about it soon. Mm -hmm. Well, you, well you, you, mean, and you see this, this um, lower giving reflected in, particularly in performing arts organizations in town in the way the, their numbers work. All of us in town have a, compared nationally, have a much higher percentage of our budgets that come from earned revenue, from ticket mm -hmm. sales and, and those things. And we have very little that comes from <coughs> contributed revenue. And nationally, um, you see a much, a much higher percentage and then, of course, much higher volume of actual dollars. At uh, B Street, we're, depending on the year, we're anywhere from 85 to 90 percent uh, earned revenue. Now, if we were, if there was more contributed revenue coming in, we'd be able to do a lot more things to grow the company to, uh, to do um, bigger, bigger productions and, and, and more things. But as a young, uh, younger arts organization, mm -hmm. compared to, say, the Crocker, sure. California Musical Theater, Ballet and Symphony, mm -hmm. you all have been able to put together a footprint and a presence in this community fairly quickly, if you look at it from a chronological mm -hmm. perspective. What do you consider some of the success attributes that have gotten you to the point where it is that you're actually able to break ground on a new facility in the midst of the climate that we're in right now? Well, I mean, a couple things. And one is the double edge of this issue we were just talking about, the, about the reliance on con of, of, of earned revenue. That's also allowed us at B Street to be incredibly nimble mm -hmm. as we move through the recession. We weren't, all, we weren't relying so much on contributed revenue in the first place. So if, the, if that went down, we were very used to being able to, to maneuver our, our costs and our revenues to rely, to keep pull back and rely on, on, earned, on earned money. As we're moving to the, the future of the company, um, we will need to see an increase in, in contributions to get there and, and a greater investment from the community to mm -hmm. do that. But the return on that investment is also going to be going to be great. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and I think the key, and I can tell you this, the, the key to, to uh, success here is just not stopping. Right. It's just to keep going, no matter what. The um, counterpoint to the uh, B Street experience is the California Musical Theater, where 15% of its budget is contributed, 85% relying on ticket sales. So when you get into the recessive environment in which we've been, if that's all the contributed income you've got, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And of course it has been. The only, the, the, what we're talking about here, the only real avenue for us to change the, the, uh, the environment significantly is through a personal given. We've already cited the fact that we have few corporate headquarters here. We're a government town with what, 100,000 uh, state workers, many of whom with reduced incomes and on furloughs. We don't have a lot of old family money like San Francisco and other cities of its size. So if we don't improve personal giving, we really don't have anywhere to go in terms of other options. The thing is, it's <coughs> individuals across the country that make a difference to arts communities. That's so right. it is personal giving. I think that everybody thinks that there's some magic bullet. And if you can just get more public funding or if you can just get more corporate dollars, you're, everything's going to be mm -hmm. fine. The reality is it's up to individuals. They're the only ones that are going to make a difference. You know, I, I think there's also a, an issue... People tend to think about the arts as a monolithic uh, culture. The business plans for museums are very, very different than the business plans for performing arts organizations. Sure. So the Crocker, every year, relies on over 50% of its operating budget to come through donations. If those donations don't come in, the operations cease to, to be viable. Um, and, and I think that's important to remember. So museums really look at endowment. The Crocker's endowment is actually less than its annual operating budget. Really? That's unbelievable. Yeah, that so it's, unbelievable. A, it's 125 years old, yeah. 
-hmm. but in fact is pretty much a brand new institution uh, in the way it's really looking at its business. So mm -hmm. in reinventing yourself, I, I, I want to just bring to you all, your attention uh, some comments from a 2006 report by the Irvine Foundation. It says that many arts organizations insulated for years from the immediate effect of market shifts have continued to operate as an, with an outdated understanding of what the public values. Individual organizations in the sector as a whole have increased fixed costs by consistently by building new facilities and adding programs even while attendance and earned and contributed revenues remain stagnant or fall. So that, that's a generalization based on their research, but yet people here in Sacramento are able to forge ahead. Not saying that everyone has, but in terms of the success that your two organizations are having right now, how is it that you respond to that assertion? Well, you know, when I came to the Sacramento at the end of 1999, I came with the philosophy that anybody could build a building, mm -hmm. um, that the building uh, of a new Crocker was not what's going to matter. What was going to matter was engagement with the community. I still believe that, and I think the Crocker has a long way to go. But in 10 years, we've grown our membership from 3,000 to over 13,000 people. We've increased our attendance from 90,000 to 250,000. I mean, we have changed the way people think of the museum. And we've done that through a diversity of programs and exhibition offerings. We've tried to be there for the community and meet their needs. Now, what's hard is we're working in an environment that is absolutely shifting. People are consuming culture and, you know, arts and culture in a different way than they used to. No longer do they look at the museum or the performing arts organization as, you know, the, the academic head, the, the authority. <coughs> Um, we've, we're living in a situation today where the society believes that, you know, in their own curatorship. I think that's really important and it's exciting for museums. Everyone's their own personal Scorsese or Picasso, well, so to speak. It, look at American Idol. Mm -hmm. Everybody's vote counts and has exactly the mm -hmm. same weight as anybody else's vote right. on what is good. I, I think that democ uh, the democratization of that is, is really interesting. I think it's also really difficult for arts organizations to navigate because we're right in the middle of that shift. So we need to be very engaged in the community and we need to understand communities have uh, issues and opinions and they're going to push back on us in places that make us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. Yeah. It's scary. But Dennis, I, I want to ask you the question to follow up on Lyle's point, which is how do you see arts organizations within this region negotiating that shift that's taking place? Well, I, I, I'd say they're, uh, they're, they're, they're rather slow to the game. I mean, for one thing, Eurocentric forms of, of performing arts like ballet, opera, and symphony are diminishing, are facing diminishing audiences all over the country. New York City Opera, the Philadelphia Orchestra, Orchestra is in bankruptcy. So we're facing that shift in terms of the interest in those forms of, uh, of uh, culture in the first place. Secondly, we're dealing in an environment in which there's very little arts education in the schools. So youngsters are not being given exposure to the classical traditions and therefore the audiences of the future are in question. Uh, you also have uh, issues of, of money being cut for student outreach for all of our performing arts groups. So paying for busing to bring youngsters in to see our ballet and opera and symphony where normally we get kids hooked on these, these forms of the performing arts, we're not able to, to support that as much. So all of these things are conspiring to challenge our ballet, our symphony, our opera, our sacrament, our theater company as never before. They're trying to keep their pulse on this changing uh, market. They're trying to differentiate their programming. They're trying to find smaller venues in which their costs are lower so that they can feed their niche audience without so much overhead. I think they're all trying hard. Uh, a, a case in point, California Musical Theater has two weeks in its Broadway season. They have, by necessity, had to collapse that into one week, and now there will be some disgruntled uh, folk who will not have the same seating. But at least that will be a more cost-effective model for California musical theater going forward. Well, let's, let's talk for a minute about, you, you mentioned the issue of education. And as we talk about patronage to the arts and the democratization of art forms in this country, another thing is to focus on is how is it that we are raising the next crop of arts patrons in this region. You talked about K through 12 education. According to a Hewlett Foundation report, Unfinished Canvas, 89% of K through 12 schools in California fail to offer any standards-based courses that 
uh, touch all four of the disciplines in arts, music, visual arts, theater, and dance. And so they fall short of the state goals. What are we doing in terms of not only touching our children, but instilling in them the creativity so that that way not only do they enjoy art, but it improves their own academic performance? Well, this is, I mean, this, and this kind of, this trend has been going on for a long time. And in okay. fact, B Street Theater is here in Sacramento because in 1986, Timothy Busfield was looking for a place to get professional theater into schools, and there was nothing going on here, and arts budgets were being cut across, even, even then. So and at our company, we, we started on this. Um, this is indeed the core of our mission, is getting professional arts out into the schools and, and serving kids, and r right now that program has grown to expand through 12 counties. We reach 200,000 kids through a, a 200, program. 200,000 kids per year. Per year, yeah, <laughs> per year. We're, we're rambling around in a big white van with performers <laughs> and going into the Kappa Gymna Auditorium uh, three times a day, uh, mm -hmm. about 35 weeks a year um, throughout. And it's, it's, it's actually not as well known as our main stage right. um, at B Street, which actually didn't start until five years after our, our company. But, but this issue is, is a big one, uh, arts education, and how do we not only expose kids to, to the arts, but how do we actually get into the real training, mm -hmm. which is increasingly important. I, we were in D.C. and we were looking at a study by the Conference Board uh, and Americans for the Arts that, <laughs> d that talked to corporate uh, leaders, executives who were doing hiring, and um, superintendents of school districts. And the executives said, we need creative people. Right. We need a workforce that is full of creative thinkers and creative people, uh, and we can't find them. And what we look for is arts training mm -hmm. when they're coming out of school. And the superintendent is saying, we're not giving them arts right. training. Well, so there's a, a huge gap here. Here's an interesting fact about our region. According to the author Richard Florida with George Mason University, he wrote a book called The Rise of the Creative uh, Class in Hoosier City. And he, he and his researchers identified Sacramento as actually one of the top ten most creative cities in the country. Um, this was reported in Fast Company magazine, and it says here that talented people keep congregating in cities where they understand intuitively that working with other talented people spurs them to be even more creative. And so this, while somehow we have become successful as being identified as having an emerging creative class, how do we get back, in addition to uh, efforts like your own get back to make sure, making sure that we're nurturing that creative class for the employers of the future. I see it as an economic issue. Well, the elements are there. I mean, we are, I think, uh, one of the most diverse populations. We have a thriving gay and lesbian population. A lot of the things that are normally attributed to a high uh, a degree of creativity on that index, we have right here. But we lack the infrastructure around it. A lot of that is is uh, our, our feeding small niche, uh, you know, operations throughout Midtown and in our region. But we 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 lack infrastructure. We need arts education back in the schools. We need more money for student outreach to get them involved uh, in these kinds of things. We need more uh, festivals sponsored by our city and county governments that bring these people together in different uh, endeavors. Um, more venues, more, more places venues. to congregate, yes. to share yeah. opinions and ideas. We badly need a 9 to 1200 seat theater, for instance. Where is the connective tissue mm -hmm. in this region in terms of, of initiatives, collaborations, and the like to try and build that, that sort of infrastructure that you're talking about? Well, I think the, uh, the mayor certainly had the right idea when he launched, among other initiatives during this first term, the uh, For Art's Sake initiative. Without question, that was a bold uh, step. What he and his colleagues and all of we have discovered in the, in the midst of that initiative, however, is that our arts in such crisis, we've had to turn our attention to keeping them alive and developing plans for their ultimate sustainability. So we haven't had much time right now to get into the creative ventures, the new initiatives that we'd hoped. So uh, mm -hmm. that, that's a bold initiative, a significant leadership. Uh, but right now we're severely challenged, and the people of Sacramento, if they want that world-class city that the mayor often refers to, then we're going to have to do what world-class cities do, and we're going to have to step up as individuals, we're going to have to step up as government, and we're going to have to collude to uh, provide proper support now, typically, the but Now, typically, world-class is being used right now in the context of retaining the kings and, and building an arena. Okay, where, where's the relationship between 
that discussion and the discussion of the arts. Well, well that's where I was going. It, it's essentially the same question. If right. we as a region want to be achieve that level of greatness, and for a lot of people that means professional sports teams and, and world-class facilities that you put those concerts into um, and sports teams into and arts organizations. It's the, it's the same question. Are we going to make that investment collectively as a region to, uh, to reach that goal or, or aren't we? And, and to reap the dividends that we want, which is that, and for some it's world-class status, for some it's just being a great community and, and always pushing to be the best community we can be and not settling. It's about, if that's the dividend we want, we, and all that comes with that, and those dividends are huge. Corporations want to want to be here. Creative people want to settle here and start their businesses. If we want to be, have the green economy start here, those people are going to come here because there's great civic amenities. And this, but this is the question we face as a region: invest and reap the dividends, or don't and don't. Yeah, there, there's a reason yeah. the uh, Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce has a civic amenities committee. Mm -hmm. That is because they realize that civic amenities, including the arts, are absolutely related to the economy of this area and to the quality of life. So so often I think people do make it, you know, a, an economic uh, argument and they tend to look at today and what the the numbers are at any particular moment. And what we really need to be thinking about is tomorrow. If we want to create an economy, a growing um, class of people that really will help pull Sacramento up into um, a great prosperity. We need to start somewhere, and yet generally, those small startups have a creative spark, and it's it, it's people getting together, sharing, exchanging ideas, and then bringing them to fruition. Uh, those kinds of places are what is really important, and very often those places are civic gathering spots. Let me let me let me pose another question for you. I, I want to be the average Joe on the street. We talk a lot about arts, visual arts, performing arts. You know, people say, "Well, that's highbrow." That, that is, uh, you know, that's for old folks, that's for rich people, whatever, okay? It, it is Eurocentric culture 101, okay? For the average Joe and Jane in the street, and why does nurturing this creative class and having a vibrant arts, arts scene to the person that is just working someplace in retail or something like that, why does it matter? What's in it for them? Well, for one thing, if you're, if you're stuck in one of these large, uh, mind-numbing state buildings, the thought of something going on <laughs> out in the mall or in, in the park during your lunch hour and breaks, for instance, as happens in many major cities where dancers dance and singers sing and actors act, that, for one thing, would enrich the quality of their lives. Just ask them. You know, they would take advantage of that. Sacramento Ballet, for instance, did some guerrilla kinds of activities during the recession. They had things like beer and ballet. So people who like to have a beer and come in and watch some very athletic and talented dancers dance can come into a small studio sitting, have a couple of beers, and watch ballet. You know, uh, the opera has taken its singers out just to do arias in the parks. The symphony is performed mm -hmm. in the schools and in the parks. So they're trying very hard to take it out to the public, and when they do, the reaction they get is really, really very strong. You know, the reality is we are all consumers of the arts, whether we think about them or not, whether or not we attend a performance or not. I mean, the fact that we're getting dressed in the morning and making aesthetic decisions on what we put together, that is an arts activity. You know, what tie you picked to go with that suit, you know, that a made a difference. And it is. It's, it's a lovely choice. It's, I'm not sure it's good art, but it is art. But it is. You're making a choice, and you want to make sure that it's as a form choice as possible. And yeah. I think that, you know, all of these things go together, and people just don't always think about the interrelated and the connectedness of right. them. I totally agree. The way you decorate your home, the way you landscape your yeah. yard, everything you do is in some way related to the arts aesthetic. Well, let's get to the big question, <laughs> folks. I want to play a little bit of, of a game with all of you, okay? I want each one of you to imagine that you have the attention of all California. And you've been charged this year because Jerry and Ann are, well, they're not on vacation, but they just need a break. And you're going to d deliver the State of the Union uh, for California, and the eyes of all 40 million citizens are upon you, Sacramento and the rest of the state as well. And at that moment, you're, you are speaking to the leaders from the governor on down and to the average Joe and Jane. What would be your one call to action, each one of you? What would be your one call to action 
that would advance the arts for the benefit of all. And I'm going to start with you, Bill. Well, sure. I mean, there, and there's a lot. And some of it's about this investment dividend thing. But, you know, I think the question I would ask back to all of California is, why should we settle for anything but the best for our kids in this state, statewide? Why? Why should we have the, the, the lowest uh, arts, arts giving um, in, the, in the country? Okay. Uh, Lyle? Well, I think it's also about children. It's about schools. It's about the fact that we need to put the arts back into schools. We need to make sure that that happens statewide because young audiences turn into adult audiences. Okay. Dennis, you get the last word. I, I'm not going to be very different from the theme right now. As far as I'm concerned, if I look out at, the, at, at you know, the average Joe, I'd say, you know in your heart that you got hooked on some kinds of art forms in school. I know I did. Most of the members of boards of these arts organizations did. Yeah. Dennis, you, you want have 10 that, seconds. You want that same experience for your children, you have to pay for it, and you have to advocate for arts being put back in the schools. All right. I would like to thank the American Leadership Forum for its editorial partnership and our guests, Bill Blake, Lyle Jones, and Dennis Mangers. That is our show for today. We're out of time. There's lots of talk on television, but only a few places where you can be a part of the conversations that matter. And today, I really think this was a conversation that mattered. I'm Scott Syfax, and you've been watching Studio Sacramento. Join us next time, right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.